how do you think about the challenge that's inherent in every life of having to navigate a world that you, in some sense, have very little control over? It's hard to predict where it will go, what will be thrown at you, while we have this really, really deep-seated instinct to want to be able to order our reality and order ourselves. It seems like there's a conflict there that we're constantly trying to navigate as individuals. Mm -hmm. Well, you're right. That conflict will always be there. And and many times people think, well, if I get this all figured out, if I have the right religious faith, or if I have the right set of practices in the outer world, or I read the right book, um, you know, I walk into the sunlit meadow where that anxiety is gone. Well, that never happens. Mm-hmm. Well, the only non-anxious people are are basically psychotics or people who are drugged out. And you know, there's a there's a cost for the, both of those treatments. So anxiety is part of the currency of life. Anxiety is the price of the ticket to life. If you want to be in life, you're gonna to have to deal with anxieties. The question is always the pragmatic question, and what does that anxiety make you do? What does it keep you from doing? Now, again, if what you're doing is meaningful, that's a story, so to speak, larger than your anxiety. Now, to give you a very practical example, I'm a card bearing introvert, but a good part of my life is public in public speaking and so forth. And the way I deal with that is if I thought everybody's up there to have a critical opinion of me, that's enough to sort of shrivel any sense of of your calling to do that kind of of work. Right. I simply say, hey, this is not about you, stupid. This is this is about what is it you've learned along the way that might be helpful to people who are struggling to make sense of their own lives. If you think this is useful, why wouldn't you share it? I have that little talk with myself before every public occasion Mm. because it it puts the ego to the side there and says, all right, this is something you're supposed to be doing with your life. Are you going to let your anxiety keep you from doing it? The answer is clearly no. Mm. It's not about you. It's it's about, you know, what's bringing us together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you you mentioned ego there briefly. Now we've hit on, at this point, soul, psyche, Ego, um, the ego gets a bad rap a lot. I think in in modern times, it's seen as something that can be selfish, uh, self interested. It kind of deludes us into thinking we're more important than we are. But in the Jungian school of thought, I think the ego plays a very important role in our overall psychical structures. Could you tell us a little bit about how Jung conceptualized the ego and how you work with maybe even your patients' egos in a constructive way in your practice? Certainly, very good questions, gentlemen. Um, First of all, the ego is itself a cluster of energy. It's one complex among many here that we have. And it's tasked with very important functions. It's our interface with the external world. Your ego says, oh, that car is coming toward me, so I'll step back to the curb. Uh, The ego says, uh, oh, you just got burned when you touched that iron, didn't you? I guess you need to be mindful of that in the future. So the ego's function in the outer world is to interface and you know, preserve this organism so you don't step in the way of, of the car or walk right up to the tiger. Um, but the ego is very malleable, very invadable. And we're only in our pure ego state from time to time in the course of any given day. So for example, if you step in a shower in the morning and it's too hot and too cold, you make an adjustment with the water. And that's the ego in relationship to the external world in an appropriate fashion. But from that point on, the ego is often flooded with material. And because a lot of that material is unconscious, we literally don't know we're sort of possessed creatures, so to speak. The ego is most of the time driving under the influence of the complex. And where the ego gets into the problems that you were referencing here is when it thinks it's the boss, thinks it's in charge, arrogates to itself a power it doesn't have. And there, our psychological term for that is inflation. The ancient word was hubris, where I think I'm the boss, or I think that I'm in charge of the universe. Well, right. guess what? The universe is going to creep up on you and convince you otherwise pretty, pretty clearly. So the ego is essentially, a, in its best sense, a tool to interface with the external world. And in addition, I should add, the ego's in charge of values and choices. Mm. If you're gonna make choices, by what values do you live? And if you don't, you can be sure your complexes are doing it for you. 
And once again, what spills into the world may not be what you want to do with your life or who you wish to, to, to be as a person. Mm. Right. It's like the world wants you to do one thing. Your ego wants you to do another thing. And then your internal psyche is actually saying, well, hold on, let's see what we really want here. Um, that's right. And, and then so, let me just say, that's yeah, where we yeah. started at, at, at midlife. My mm -hmm. ego had done its assignment well, but the psyche revolted. That was the contradiction. Right. And I think that happens in everybody's life to some degree.